Julie Otsuka's work of literary fiction, The Swimmers, is her third published book. It's Otsuka's most intimate work to date, inspired by her mother's dementia experiences, as well as her observations as a recreational swimmer. Part 1. The Underground Pool is narrated in the first-person plural by The Swimmers, a group of dedicated recreational swimmers in their neighborhood pool. Though they live extremely varied lives outside the pool and have a wide range of personalities and vocations, they are bonded by their passion for swimming. Their motives for swimming aren't precisely the same, yet they all fall into the same broad categories. They keep returning to the pool to either recover, be it physically or emotionally, escape life's worries and disappointments, or find a feeling of belonging. The pool, in some manner, provides them with something they cannot get elsewhere. Part 1 aims to explore who the individuals who make up this community are at their deepest and most personal levels, delving into issues such as obsessions and compulsions, group loyalty, addiction, and familial relationships. In Part 2, The Crack, a little fissure forms on the pool floor, prompting anxiety, diversion, and an abundance of crazy theories. Experts provide contradictory advice and hypotheses that cannot be verified, but in the long term they have no actual solutions. The swimmers' various explanations and answers reveal more about their personalities and hang-ups than the crack. Responses and hypotheses from the above-ground community are equally as varied and insignificant. The fracture grows into other cracks but no definitive solution to the source or implications is discovered. The swimmers discover that the pool will be permanently closed due to an abundance of caution. The swimmers experience the stages of sorrow as the planned closure approaches but are eventually forced to face their loss. Part 3, Diem Perdidi, shifts the narrative's emphasis from the swimmers and the pool to Alice, one of the swimmers and her family, as related in the second person by Alice's daughter. A list of items Alice does and does not recall indicates the progression of her frontotemporal dementia. Her earliest memories, such as being imprisoned in a detention camp during World War II, remain the most vivid. Alice has a spouse, a daughter, and two boys. Her first child, a girl, died before birth. She nearly married a man called Frank when she was younger but he fell in love with someone else, so she married her present spouse instead. Alice was quite close to her daughter throughout her youth, and she treasured this bond. However, by the conclusion of Part 3, Alice has forgotten her daughter's name on many occasions. Part 4, Bella Vista, is written from the viewpoint of Bella Vista, a for-profit memory care facility where Alice is placed. It addresses Alice and tells her what to anticipate during her stay. It convinces Alice that her dementia will only worsen, and that any chance of recovery is futile. It covers her last years in Bella Vista, painting a picture of greed, duplicity, and neglect, as well as boredom, loss of worth and dignity, and waiting to die. Bella Vista warns her that all that has previously defined her and her life is no longer relevant since her identity is not crucial. Alice discovers that this will be her last home before she dies. Despite what she learns from Bella Vista about what life will be like there, she has no control over her destiny. Alice's daughter resumes the story in Part 5, You're a Neuro. She regrets ignoring the early indications of Alice's dementia before obtaining a diagnosis. Given Alice's transformation, it's difficult to think she didn't notice anything was wrong. She also feels bad about the distance that she put between them, particularly given how close Alice was to her mother. Alice's husband is lost without her at home. He continues to live as if she will return home. Alice weakens at Bella Vista to the point that she is scarcely recognizable. She stops talking and eventually dies. A doctor studies her brain tissue and confirms the diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia, a form of Pick's disease. Her case will be presented at the Euroneuro, a major neuropathology conference held in Paris.
Alice's husband may finally move on after her death. The ending of the story implies that her daughter isn't quite there yet. It concludes on an unclear note, a recollection in which Alice seemed to want to say something to her daughter, but couldn't. If you have any suggestion of which book I should summarize, please let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe.